Water. The earth is an inviting place. All forms of life learn to live together. From the smallest to the largest, the weak and the powerful share in the planet's resources with a single aim, survival. They'll do anything to live. They make war and peace even with those they could easily crush. Some species learn to exchange goods and services through a kind of barter that scientists call symbiosis. It's nature's answer to the business of survival. There's never a dull moment in the natural world. Animals either fight or take flight. But there's strength in numbers. Mutual aid begins by ganging up with the neighbors. It's a winning combination for all living species. <laughs> Dolphins fish together in groups of three or four. A coordinated attack is no guarantee of success, but each can count on catching something in the end, as long as they stick together. Penguins help each other by staying united, not to attack, but for their simple protection. This is the penguin's main predator. Orcas, more commonly known as killer whales, band together to break up the penguin pack by smacking the water with their tails. The penguins take evasive action. By staying close, then splitting up and regrouping again, the orcas don't know where to turn. The tactic minimizes the risk of capture. A similar tactic is adopted by schools of fish. When sharks move in together, the school rallies to outwit the enemy in a deadly game of cat and mouse. But if penguins are born to help each other, would they help an intruder? The idea, even for a penguin, isn't so far-fetched. Two different species can sometimes benefit from mutual aid. To start with, they share the same beach. Orcas not only covet penguins, they also hunt elephant seals. The penguins and the elephant seals alert each other when they flee.
This is the most basic business arrangement, involuntary but effective. All it takes is a common territory, a common enemy, and a little natural curiosity. Congratulations on a marriage of interests, for better or for worse. There are more dynamic and sustainable relationships between different species in the animal world. Even the imposing Nile crocodile must disguise her nest near Murchison Falls in Uganda. But what's this? Hardly a threat to a crocodile. On the contrary, the birds are allies. Different species of riverbank birds nest here too. They watch over the crocodile's nest, and in turn, the crocodile's presence reassures them. They take it in turns to babysit. Mother croc disappears to hunt for game, leaving her eggs in the care of the birds. She's buried her eggs in the sand. A hungry Nile monitor lizard seizes the opportunity. Birds trigger the alarm. The crocodile's own appetite distracts her attention. A kingfisher decides that enough is enough. They also bury their eggs here. But the lizard's detective work finally pays off. No pesky little bird is going to stop it now. The entire brood of crocodile eggs is at risk. One last desperate call. This time she's got the message. The lizard lets its guard down. Part of the nest is saved thanks to the vigilance of the birds. Protection rackets bind animals together in contracts that know no frontiers. Staying alive is a full-time business in every ecosystem. At sea, hiding is more difficult than on land, so the weak exploit the strong to stay alive. The deadly tentacles of jellyfish provide an effective shield. Pilot fish are spared because they serve as a good bait for their predator host. 
easy pickings by themselves, the fish turn their weakness into tactical advantage both for themselves and for their guardian angel. The oceans are full of symbiotic relationships. Tropical lagoons yield endless variations on the same theme. Here, coral reefs form one of the planet's richest and most complex ecosystems and produce all kinds of matchmaking. What would dare hide in a bed of needles? Sea urchins don't seem to profit from the multitude of tiny fish that befriend them, but the relationship has not been fully explained. Fish, needles, tentacles, these are just some of the living weapons desperately courted for survival. Some animals even resort to chemical weapons for protection. Cnidaria are part of a large family of organisms that include sea anemones and corals. Their poisonous tentacles sting anything that floats by. The clownfish is immune to the sea anemone and it's willing to do a deal. To seduce its host, the clownfish brushes gently against it. The fish's scales contain a mucus which changes chemical composition on contact with the anemone. In effect, the fish slowly vaccinates itself against the poison. Soon, it plunges right in. But it must keep to the deal. If it leaves for too long or chooses another host, it will lose its immunity. With a deal struck, the clownfish now serves as both bait and maid for the anemone. The fish cleans its partner's orifice, which acts as both mouth and anus. Stranger still, a boxer crab armed with a miniature anemone on both claws. While the crab snacks, flakes of food fall to the anemones. So what advantage does the crab gain? the intimate protection of the anemones. They may be small, but they sting like a bee. Intrude on a crab's territory and expect no mercy. A boxer crab with a good pair of gloves can take on far bigger predators. Sea anemones are expert negotiators. Here's one living on a hermit crab. Not content with an empty shell for protection, the aggressive and territorial hermit crab seeks a live deterrent against competitors and predators. In turn, the anemone will feed on the crab's leftovers. What happens when the hermit crab outgrows its shell? It must find a larger one. But how? 
How does the hermit crab persuade the anemone to jump ship? It signals with a tactile code. Gentle stroking encourages the anemone to release its suckers from its pedestal. The crab guides its friend back on top of its new home. Chemical weapons are traded far and wide in the marine world. The sea slug dresses up in bright colors that signal to predators that it's poisonous. A shrimp hops aboard to travel under the slug's protection. The shrimp even adopts the slug's color and blends in like a chameleon. Taking full advantage of a safe ride, the shrimp feeds along the way. The shrimp's part of the bargain is to rid the sea slug of tiny parasites. Protection in exchange for spring cleaning suits the shrimp well. Shrimps befriend some of the biggest carnivores in the lagoon. Performing oral hygiene on a moray eel beggars belief, especially if the patient is temperamental. The oceans of the world are governed by the uncompromising laws of a food chain. But there are well-defined areas where the weak and the strong meet in peace. This is an unlikely paradise where hammerheads and other large predators gather simply to be cleaned by small fry like wrasses. They feed on the parasites of their seniors. Sometimes there's even a queue for the beauty parlor. The cleaners leave no orifice untended dusting up unsightly larvae and mucus on the host's skin. Customers invite attention by keeping their gills and mouths open. Remoras appear strange to the human eye with suckers on their heads. but they've evolved this way to cling to a very special host. Sharks tow them wherever they go. The remoras are very tenacious. Though they're perfectly able to find their own dinner, they prefer to scrounge off the sharks, scavenging their food and feeding on their parasites. Free food and a safe ride. Remoras also bond with rays. They're born white to blend in with their host. Every species of remora hires its own driver. Remoras are more than just cleaners, they're garbage collectors.
They love to rummage through the Ray's excrement for choice tidbits. The anus is also a good place to hide from predators. Protection, cleaning, feeding. A contract for survival in the deep. What about on land? Do animals have the same needs? On land, as much as in the sea, animals need to stay clean. Here on Midway Island, Hawaii, ticks ingratiate themselves into the lives of local inhabitants. So, what to do? You need a partner at your beck and call. But a helping hand from one of your own species may not be the most effective solution. Parasites bury themselves in the fur and feathers of animals and removal takes forever. One animal takes a radically different approach. The starling hires a miniature army to take on the miniature enemy inside it. Wood ants are perfect candidates. They attack anything that disturbs their nest. The starling takes full advantage of this behavior. It captures the ants and drops them into its feathers. Once inside, the ants get to work. Not for nothing are these ants members of the Formica species. The ticks in the bird's plumage are no match for the stinging acid the ants secrete in battle. The plumage is now covered with acid. The parasites die rapidly. Those that survive need no encouragement to run away. The starling is as good as new, but what do the ants gain from this business agreement? It would seem nothing, as they don't prey on the ticks. So the starling is, after all, the real villain of the story. The line between fair trade and selfish exploitation is blurred. Animal business is a question of weighing up cost and benefit. We must go back far in time to divine the true difference between parasite and partner. Relations like these develop very early in the life of our planet. Evidence can be found in amber, the fossilized resin of some trees. Trapped in the amber tomb for over 40 million years, here is a relationship frozen in time. A mantaphasma, half praying mantis, half stick insect and long extinct, carries a mite on its back. The mite could well be clearing its host of old scales. The balance between give and take is a grey area in nature. But the case of the cuckoo has long been as clear as its call. This is the nest of a warbler. But inside, a female cuckoo's egg has just hatched. The cuckoo chick begins life by dealing with any potential competition, in this case, warbler eggs.
Not only has the cuckoo been incubated by a warbler, it now wants exclusive feeding rights. The warbler parents provide. The much-loved cuckoo is one of nature's most ruthless parasites. The warblers don't even know they've been duped. The cuckoo exploits other birds too, not just the hapless warbler. In the insect world, parasitical brood behavior borders on predation. This caterpillar would become a cabbage white butterfly, but it's about to fall for a deadly trick. A wasp arrives uninvited. It's not interested in the cabbage, but the caterpillar. The wasp wants to lay its eggs inside the living larder of the caterpillar, where its larvae can grow. The caterpillar's only real defense is to squirt the enemy with sticky cabbage juice. The wasp is determined to stick to its own plan. It manages to inject its eggs into the body of the caterpillar. The larvae will grow without killing their host. A week later, the larvae burrow their way out. The next stage is for the larvae to sow cocoons and change into adult wasps. So what possible advantage has the caterpillar gained? It'll die a slow death without morphing into a butterfly. The wasp is a deadly parasite, all take and no give. Unlike the cabbage white, this butterfly does everything to protect its caterpillars. Like other butterflies, it chooses plants to lay its eggs. Once hatched, the caterpillar is beautifully protected. But the day comes when it must banish itself from the Garden of Eden and expose itself to the outside world. The odds don't look too good for the caterpillar, but nature is full of surprises. The caterpillar pulls off the ultimate ruse. It secretes a pheromone, a chemical substance designed to attract the same species. Only the pheromone mimics the smell of an ant larva. What a message to the ants. Take me to your nest. Ant larvae share their nest with caterpillars. And with guards all around, what a safe place to grow up. The caterpillar doesn't shy from giving out orders. This amplified rattle is the sound of the caterpillar demanding to be fed. The ants respond generously to the detriment of their own larvae. The caterpillar has spun the perfect illusion.
but it finally does give something back. It produces a succulent nectar on its skin to the delectation of the ants. The caterpillar redeems itself from being a mere parasite. But the process of evolution is unpredictable. Relationships can end up being fair or disintegrate into pure exploitation at any time. Even as the caterpillar metamorphoses, it continues to make demands on the ants. Born into an alien world, the butterfly has nothing to fear. It probably still smells of the caterpillar's pheromone. Wings are meant to fly, far away from its adoptive family. Throughout evolution, some business partners depend on each other so much they become inseparable. Their relationship changes their behavior and even the way they look. Pollinating insects have made this kind of lifelong pact with flowers. They scatter the flower's pollen in return for feeding off the nectar. A flower is nothing if it can't attract insects. The more they sparkle, the more insects will explore them and coat themselves with the pollen that assures their reproduction. Some flowers even change their shape to slow down their partners so they pick up as much pollen as possible. These tubular stems hide nectar right at the bottom. So insects evolved long feelers to get it. It's what scientists call the co-evolution of associates. Both flower and insects evolved to suit each other. Some associations between insects and plants seem to defy the laws of nature. Specialized glands containing enzymes enable carnivorous plants to digest their prey. They take no prisoners. On the high plains of South Africa, one such plant, the Rerigula, made peace with an insect. Its leaves secrete a sticky resin that glows in the sun. What a fly trap. Here's a bug seemingly destined for an early grave. In fact, it's specially adapted to survive the Rerigula, and you won't find it anywhere else but on this plant. So what's the secret? Long legs act as stilts and help it to get over the sticking points. But what if accidental contact is made? Well, the glue is simply not strong enough to stick. What a blessing for the plant to find a partner that can survive and ensure its reproduction. Young bugs find protection inside a flowering fortress. As they rummage inside, they pick up the pollen.
But this is not the end of the story. The Rerigula is different from other carnivorous plants. It may make a good fly trap, but it doesn't have digestive enzymes to consume its victims by itself. The insect will help it out again. Most victims end up exhausting themselves in their hopeless struggle to escape. Enter the bug again at a timely moment. It surgically inserts its rostrum into the trapped insects and sweeps up what's inside. An effortless meal and completely risk-free. The bug's digestion produces excrement rich in nitrogen, which it then deposits on the flower. The plant immediately absorbs the nitrogen fertilizer as the only way it can exploit its prey. Plant and bug are completely dependent on each other. Inseparable couples are rare in nature and usually the result of a long shared history together. After the dinosaurs, the planet begins to renew itself. The climate is hot and humid. It favors mushrooms and fungus. Life as far apart as plants, microorganisms and insects thrive and begin to form all kinds of associations in this hothouse. A three-way partnership, or symbiosis, emerges. The ant, the mushroom, and incredibly, antibiotic material. This example of interdependency survives today, unchanged for 50 million years. The cutout artists are hard at work. They feather their underground nests with the fruits of their labors. Their caves are vast mushroom beds of constant temperature and humidity. The ants dissect and mash the leaves into a compost. Mushrooms as fine as an angel's hair grow in abundance. In fact, the mushrooms have lost their ability to grow by themselves outside the ant's nest. Workers pre-digest the mushrooms into tiny balls, food for the ants' larvae. It's the only meal they accept. The survival of the whole colony depends on the mushroom. The queen forms a new colony elsewhere by bringing along a sample ball to kickstart her own culture. This way, both ant and mushroom colonize new territory. In spite of the ants' ruthless exploitation of the mushrooms for their own survival, the mushrooms gain by far the most from the relationship. The fungus is nourished and given the chance to spread over several square meters throughout the cave. But the ants go one important step further. They cure the mushrooms of disease by applying filamentous bacteria shaped like fine threads from special pits on their bodies. The ants cultivate this bacteria by secreting nutrients from glands connected to these pits. From master cultivators to nurses fighting disease, 
the ants will do all they can to preserve their mushrooms. The three-way association between mushrooms, insects and bacteria is the oldest form of mutual aid scientists know of. It shows just how much each partner depends on the other for survival. Symbiosis becomes indispensable for survival for another species, termites. Like the ants and their mushrooms, termites depend on a tripartite alliance based on food. But in their case, the allies live in the termites' own stomachs. They devour wood and other organic matter, but they can't digest the cellulose in the wood alone. The termites depend on much smaller organisms to do the work for them. This is the termite's stomach. Their digestive tube contains a special fermentation pocket. It's an excellent place for microscopic single-celled animals called protozoa. They not only digest the cellulose, but feed off it too. The protozoa host special bacteria that sweep up leftovers and produce nitrogen, which is absorbed by the termite. Termites pick up protozoa and bacteria by eating the molting material and excrement of other termites. It's a complicated threesome, but who would have bet on such different organisms working together so efficiently for their own good? <laughs> Our partners in nature are sometimes so small, you have to scratch the surface to find them. This chimpanzee seems perfectly capable of fending for itself when it comes to food but it too depends on invisible friends. Its intestines are full of bacteria that help it digest. Good bacteria devour bad. More than 400 kinds of good bacteria inhabit the large intestine. Without them, many mammals, including humans, would remain weak and ill all their lives. Bacteria live freely, but they like to associate with more evolved organisms to find a home in them and a meal. They're everywhere, even at the bottom of the ocean, where they do a power of good. Pineapple fish lurk in dark caves. They associate with light-producing bacteria. This is one of them. For the moment, it isn't giving off any light. The bacteria infiltrate the gills of the pineapple fish and enter bioluminescent glands called photophores. There, they thrive in a culture full of oxygen. The bacteria multiply and, thanks to a special enzyme, produce light in the photophores of the pineapple fish. The fish use the light to attract prey and also to communicate with each other during their reproductive cycle. The flashlight fish is another species that exploits bioluminescent bacteria. It adapted to take full advantage of the bacteria by developing an organ and valve that turn on and off like the indicator of a car. So the flashlight communicates with its own species in Morse code. 
It also attracts prey and scares off predators. Bioluminescent bacteria are valuable partners in an underworld devoid of light from the sun. Comb jellyfish adapted too. In the darkest abyss, they are able to reflect light from bioluminescent bacteria in order to lure and catch their prey. Bacteria are responsible for some of the earliest forms of life. In primitive oceans, two different kinds associated to create living organs. Mutual aid has evolved dramatically since the beginning of time. Humans too take part in the wild world of animal business. In northern Kenya, the Baran tribe shares hunting grounds with the honey guide bird. The honey guide bird leads the hunters to their goal. The men first whistle to call the bird. The bird responds and leads the way. Gradually, the bird perches closer and closer to the ground, a sign that the hunters are warm. Finally, when the bird changes tune, the men know they've found what they're looking for, honey. The bird can't get to the hive for bees, and the men need the bird to locate the honey. It waits patiently for its share of the bargain. Plump larvae. Mutual aid between man and animal is rare. Usually, man's impact on nature has the reverse effect. It destroys ecosystems and alters the delicate balance between animals. Marriages dissolve, others take their place. In Saudi Arabia, a rubbish dump inspires two quite different animals to band together. They wouldn't do so without the presence of man. The dump is a magnet for stray dogs and a colony of baboons which have conveniently chosen to live by this easy source of food. The two species coexist here peacefully and take turns to guard the dump for themselves against other wild packs. The relationship between dogs and baboons is far from simple. Baboons live in an orderly, hierarchical society split into different family groups. Delousing takes place within a family unit, a sign of submission and belonging. Baboons delouse the dogs too. So could a domestic animal like a dog be adopted by a baboon? Life on the wrong side of the tracks encourages some unusual behavior. In each group, a single male baboon dominates a harem and jealously guards his females from other prying males. The dominant male punishes interlopers. Males may make up for being single by stealing a baby. If it's a female, so much the better. It'll grow up to become the favorite in any future harem.
Incredibly, that goes for puppy dogs too. A male baboon forcibly adopts a puppy. Dogs and baboons are both social animals, and this deviant behavior proves how strong the link between species can be. The growing intimacy between wild and domestic species will change the way animals behave in the future, and even create new kinds of associations. The variety of partnerships in nature shows how adaptable the species are, forever negotiating their way to a safer and richer life. From blissful coexistence and mutual profit to cruel exploitation, all forms of interaction play a part in the business of survival.